Ezekiel chapter 16. And we'll just read, start with reading the first two verses. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. We'll open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can gather here today and we can sing praises to you, Lord, and share in each other's fellowship. And Lord, now we ask that you just prepare our hearts and our minds for the message. Lord, I ask that you just help us to put aside distractions and just help us to uh, dedicate our full attention to you, Lord. Lord, I ask that you just give me the wisdom and understanding I need to uh, preach clearly and preach the truth. And Lord, I ask that, the, that only your truth would be heard here today. Lord, I ask that you just calm my nerves and uh, strengthen me, Lord. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> so if you haven't been um, at this church before or heard me preach before, I've been preaching through Ezekiel. Um, and Ezekiel has a particular message for the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judea. And God is sending him to tell them of their wickedness and how they have turned away from him. And by the time we get to Ezekiel chapter 16, God has already had several ways of showing the people of um, Judah that God is displeased with them and that judgment is coming. But here again, God brings another message to the people of Judah. And this message has very strong language in it. God is not sugarcoating his messages anymore. The truth has to be heard. The truth has to be declared to them. And we get this from the verse 2. Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. The word abominations here means a disgusting thing. In a ritual sense, it can be used to, to mean something that's unclean, like unclean foods or idols, or has even been used to describe a mixed marriage. In an ethical sense, it is anything that's wicked. Ezekiel is to take this message to the people of Jerusalem he is to take it with boldness. He is to take it with a surety. The people of Jerusalem need to hear about their abominations. Now, we are not going to do the entire chapter, unlike what I've usually done. Instead, we are only going to go to about verse 18. Up to about verse 18 is God building his case for why and how he has showed his love towards Jerusalem. He builds up his case of why their unfaithfulness is undeserved. So in verses 3 to 5, we show the original state that God found the people of Jerusalem at, the people of Israel. In verse chapter 3, And say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan, Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, in thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field, to the loathing of thy person, in the day that thou wast born. This is the state which God found the people of Israel. We're not given specifics, but it might be referring back to the foundation of their entire people, Abraham and Sarah. And it's important that God comes back this far. It was a common thing for the people of Israel to say that they're saved because they're the descendants of Abraham. Many times this was 
their foundation. We are God's chosen people because we are the descendants of Abraham. Surely God will always love us. Surely God will never abandon us. Surely God will save us because we are the descendants of Abraham. But God says to them, their true ancestry, well, yes, maybe from Abraham. Abraham was not some living, righteous man that they could base their foundation off. It wasn't simply because Abraham was Abraham that they are saved. It wasn't simply because Abraham was Abraham that they were loved. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. Here Joshua is declaring what God has told the people of Israel. And God is reminding the people that Abraham came out from an ungodly nation. Abraham just didn't, wasn't just simply created, but rather he came out from an ungodly people, a people tainted with, with idol worship and ungodliness. And despite this, this attitude continued. We are Abraham's children. How can God punish us? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3 and start in verse 7. This is John the Baptist as he's speaking with the Pharisees. Verse 7 reads, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So even in the New Testament, this attitude continued. We are the children of Abraham. Time and time again, this attitude reared its ugly head, thinking just because they were the descendants of somebody righteous, that they would be saved. Thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother was a Hittite. They could not rest upon their genetics, their DNA, their ancestry for salvation. But God goes on further in verse 4. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. Abraham was not the foundation sent out from a city to create a colony. See, this is how great cities expanded. If they could not increase their size physically, they would simply send people out and create another colony. They would conquer territory this way, claiming it. All the while, the great cities would, would supply their 
colonies until they were self-sufficient. But unlike these other these nations, the Israelites didn't have that. They were cast out. Abraham sojourned in a land not his own, looking for the promise. Their birth went unnoticed. Their navel was not cut. Neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. Their birth went unnoticed. Their cries for help went unheard. Now, I've never been present for a child's birth. Never seen a brand new baby straight out of the hospital. But there's a lot of noise involved, usually. And the child doesn't come out clean. But the child comes out gooey and gross. Comes out filthy. This is why the child is washed. It's hard to notice the child not being born, and yet here we see that the child's navel was not cut, which is generally the first step after the child is born, followed closely by the child being washed, salted, and swaddled. Washed, the washing cleanses off all the gunk and goo from the, from the birth. The salt helps strengthen the skin and helps to um, prevent smell. And the swaddling helps to protect the child from in the environment, from the elements, and also bring comfort to the child. But unlike a loving birth of a child, Israel didn't have that. They were left unwashed. Their navel was left uncut. Their skin left unattended to. They were left unswaddled. There was no care and compassion for the people of Israel. They were left in their filth. Not only were they left in their filth, but they were cast out. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. This speaks of the ancient practice of how children who were not wanted, even after birth, would be cast out onto the, onto the fields or onto the mountains and left to die. This was the ancient practice. Whether they were born with some defect or whether they just simply were a nuisance or not wanted at all, they were cast out to die. Israel's birth was one of pitiless, comfortless loathing. Their future had nothing but death in it, abandoned and alone covered in filth, without comfort, without protection. That was their beginning. That is what God points to, to the, for the Israelites, for Jerusalem, who always claimed that as the children of Israel, they, or Abraham, they would be saved. And God says, no. That is, your birth was no more than a pitiless, comfortless child cast out onto the hill to die. Exposed to the elements, helpless to save themselves and ignored by all others. The world didn't care for you, Jerusalem. No one wanted to save you and protect you, Judah. Judah.
That was their beginning, and the sad reality is that is our beginning too. That is the beginning of every human being born on this world. We are born filthy. We are born destitute and lonely. Our sinful nature is inherited from Adam, makes us filthy, defiled, and at our birth we are not washed. We are not salted, we are not swaddled. We are born with the only hope being death in our future. The world may fake compassion, but it has no way to help us. It has nothing that can wash us clean, nothing that it can offer to protect us from the elements of judgment to come. We are born and there is none to pity us. We are left exposed on the field to die. The world may say, oh, we have the solutions. We can offer help, compassion, but it's always a false help. The world has nothing to offer that can help revive the soul. The world has nothing to offer that can mend the relationship between us and God. Not only can the world not help, but we can't help ourselves. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. There's nothing that we can do to work our way into heaven. There's nothing that we can do to revive us. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Here our picture is given. We are all unclean things, unclean from birth, sullied by our own sinful nature. And even when we try to clean ourselves, we clean ourselves with filthy rags. That word filthy is the idea of a cloth that is covered in menstruation blood. And it may seem like a horrible picture to imagine, but how we are described is a child covered in the filth of the womb, trying to clean themselves off with a rag that is full of blood from the same place. That word rags there doesn't just simply mean rags. It can also be used to describe treachery and deceit. There is no truth in that cleansing. We just simply move around the gunk, the grime, the goo, the filth. This is the state of every human being. Born dead in sin covered in filth, forsaken by the world. But thank God it doesn't end there. Because somebody did show pity to the Israelites. Someone did show pity to us. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 6. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. 
Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. No one cared about Israel. No one cared about Abraham. In fact, when we read the record, they attacked him. They tried to take advantage of him. But God saw them. And when no one else pitied, he did. When no one else had compassion, he did. And at the simple command, live, salvation was offered. Oh, they were not saved because they worked hard. They were not saved because they are the descendants of Abraham. They are saved because God in pity and compassion looked at them and said, live. The word live there means to have life, continue in life, remain alive, or be revived. He looks at them and says, live. He offers life. And so they lived. But they were not yet cleansed. The cleansing came later when they finally accepted his offer of life. The command to live simply kept them there until they would accept him. In verse 7, I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. God gave them the opportunity to live. He allowed them to prosper and thrive. And finally, when they came, or became a people, and he came to them and, and offered himself as their God, as a husband to, to watch over them and protect them and to provide for them, they accepted that life. Verse 7 is the interim period between Abraham and Egypt. How they grew from a small group of people into a nation. And finally, as they left Egypt, as they began to finally learn about God and see all that he could do for them, all that he had done for them, Finally, when they were given the opportunity to say, will you choose this day to serve God? They said yes. And God covered their nakedness. He made a covenant with them to look after them, to provide for them, to protect them, to show love when no one else would. He washed away their filthiness. He washed away their blood and anointed them with oil. He declared to the world, these are my people. These are the people that I love, that I will cherish. And that same offer is given to the world. Christ came to this world with a message. He declared to the world, live. Despite all your filth, despite the fact that you are without, have been shown no compassion, despite that you have been shown no love, live. 
Turn with me to John chapter 3. We'll start in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in, him, believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. When Christ came to this world, he came because of love. When Christ suffered on the cross, he suffered because of love. When he died and was buried, it was because of love. And when he rose again, it was because of love. And at his resurrection, he declared to the world, live live and when we believe we accept that gift of life when we believe we are cleansed and washed clean of our filth we put aside the filthy rag and instead are embraced by Christ who takes us and washes us and anoints us He becomes the betrothed and we wait patiently for the marriage day. Today, if you have not accepted Christ as your saviour, I'm sorry to say that you are still covered in your filth of sin. This may seem harsh, but it's the truth. Just as the Israelites and the people of Jerusalem needed to be told that they were filthy at birth, so you need to be told as well. And just like the people in Jer Jerusalem were told that as they grew up and God showed mercy to, the, to them, when no one else will, God has shine mercy to you. God offers to you life today. God offers you cleansing from your filth. He offers you salvation. If only you will trust in him and accept him. If only you will lay aside the filthy rag and embrace him. And the lie is that the world can help us. It can't. The lie is that you might have time to think about it, to ponder it. But the truth is the future is not guaranteed. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Tonight is not guaranteed. The next hour is not guaranteed. If you, are, if you cannot say that you are saved with confidence... And I urge and beg you, I plead with you, come and speak with somebody today about it. We all would love to show you how you can accept Christ and be washed from your filthiness. God didn't just simply wash away the filthiness, the filthiness though. He also blessed the people of Israel. In verse 10, I clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger's skin and I girded thee about with fine linen and I covered thee with silk. 
I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen, and silk, and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour, and honey, and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. God didn't just simply leave his, his bride naked but clean. He put trappings on her. He clothed her. He provided her with wealth and prosperity. And through all of his blessings, the, the people around them took notice. The dead had come back to life. The forsaken now had grown powerful. Not in her own strength, but from the strength of God. God provided for his people. And after God will cleanse us, he also has promised to provide for us. He has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. He has promised to provide for all our needs. Not only that, but he has promised that even before we know we have a need, he already knows it. And he already has a solution for it. But the command is to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, this doesn't always mean that we will be very prosperous. I'm not here preaching that God will make us all rich. But instead, I think I'll describe it a little bit differently. The world thinks great wealth is a good thing, and they build great dams full of water. But when a drought comes, those dams will run lower and lower and eventually dry out. But God is not like that. He is like a, a small spring that never dries up. At times it may send forth a great gushing of water to meet all our needs. At times it may grow little so that only our needs are met. There is nothing left to spare. But at the end of the day, that spring, that little spring will never dry. It will never cease to meet our needs. We don't need a great dam. We just need to rely on that little spring of never-ending water of life for us. The water that can cleanse us. The water that will provide for us life through all our days and into the next. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have shown compassion and mercy to us when no one else will. Lord, we thank you that you have loved us so much that you sent your only Son to die for us and to cleanse us from our filthiness. Lord, we ask that you would just work on our hearts, that we would remember this sacrifice. And for those who have not accepted you, we ask that you would just impress upon their heart the need to accept you to be cleansed of their filthiness. Lord, we ask that you would just help us to trust in your provision and always rely on your wisdom and understanding and not on our own works or knowledge. And in Jesus' name, amen.